right, we'll get started then. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mahmoud Summers, and I'm the host for today's lecture. We thank you for joining us for the fourth lecture of the Oxford SARS-CoV-2 lecture series. For our first time viewers, this is a weekly online webinar series that hosts a wide variety of keynote speakers from around the world that are at the forefront of COVID-19 research. Our goal for the event series is to invite brilliant minds to give talks that are research focusing on a wide range of subjects to foster learning, inspiration, and innovation, and provoke conversations that will dictate the future of healthcare. Before we transition to the lecture, I'd like to briefly introduce the organization hosting this event series, upcoming webinars, and our guest speaker for today, Dr. Seema Yasmin. In addition, I'd like to highlight the procedure in which the viewers may submit questions for the guest speaker, which will be addressed towards the end of the event during a Q&A session. This event series is hosted and organized by the Oxford University Personalized Medicine Society, a student and faculty-led organization that works to weigh the benefits and detriments of precision healthcare and modern day medicine. We would like to take this moment to thank our sponsor, the Oxford Center for Personalized Medicine, which is a partnership program between the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics and St. Anne's College University of Oxford. Throughout the year, we collaborate to hold guest speaker events encompassing a diverse array of subject areas, interdisciplinary symposiums, and field trips for all affiliates of the university. Just yesterday, we held a fantastic webinar entitled Personalized Cancer Medicine, Hope or Hype, that you can check out on our YouTube channels, CPM Oxford. If you are a current member of the university and would like to get involved, please register using the above displayed QR code. If you have any questions regarding this society, please email us at oxmed at ox.ac.uk. For today's lecture, Dr. Simi Yasmin will give a talk entitled Miss Infodemics, Pandemics of Microbes and Misinformation. Dr. Yasmin trained in journalism at the University of Toronto and in medicine at the University of Cambridge. She is an Emmy award-winning journalist, poet, medical doctor, and author. She has served as an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she investigated disease outbreaks and was principal investigator on a number of CDC studies. Notably, Dr. Yasmin was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2017 and a recipient of an Emmy for her reporting of neglected diseases. In addition, Dr. Yasmin's unique experience in medicine, epidemiology, and German journalism has been called upon by the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, the Aspen Institute, Skull Foundation, and others. Currently, she is a medical analyst at CNN and a director of the Stanford Health Communications Initiative, and today she will deliver a presentation about misinfodemics in the age of COVID-19, including potential measures to stop misinformation contagion. For upcoming webinars pertaining to the lecture series, we have tomorrow, Thursday, June 4th at 5 p.m. British Summer Time, Professor Karai Nadiao of Stanford and the Director of Clinical Research for the Division of Hospital Medicine will be presenting a lecture entitled COVID-19 Immunity in Progress. In this lecture, she'll be discussing some of her experiences in successfully running an NIH, NIA, ID funded remdesivir clinical trial. The following week on Wednesday, June 10th at 5 p.m. BST, Professor Saad Omer of Yale and the inaugural director of the Yale Institute of Global Health will be presenting a lecture entitled Consequentialist Research in a Pandemic, the Case of COVID-19. To register for these events, please RSVP using the event break to ensure your spot for these lectures. For later dates, we have on Tuesday, June 16th at 5 p.m. British Summer Time, Professor Chandan K. Sen of Indiana University and the director of the Indiana Center for Regenerative Medicine and Engineering will be presenting a lecture entitled Electroceutical Management of Pathogens. Recently, his lab group developed an intriguing electroceutical mask that has been shown to neutralize SARS-CoV-2 in contact. Then on Friday, June 19th at 5 p.m. British Summer Time, Professor Scott Boyd of Stanford and a lead researcher behind the novel antibody test will be presenting a talk entitled Human Antibody Responses to SARS-CoV-2, Personal and Public. To submit questions for the live Q&A at the conclusion of the event, please use the link slash QR code to navigate to a Google form that will allow for you to submit questions. If you'd like to submit multiple questions, please use the form to make multiple submissions. Thank you. And now without further ado, we would like to welcome Dr. Seema Yasmin to present her talk. Please stand by as we transition to the guest speaker. Thank you so much. Hello, hi everybody, Salam. I hope you are safe and healthy wherever you are. I am joining you from California in the mm -hmm. States where things are very much not okay. I'm sure you're seeing on the news that at the height of the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are also experiencing protests across all 50 states. Um, police, people protesting against police brutality, against white supremacy. Um, and it's all very much connected to the 
much connected to what I'm talking about today, which is misinformation and disinformation, since, and I'll get into this later, we talk about communities that are more vulnerable to disease. And in the US, that has certainly been black communities. Um, black Americans are more than twice as likely to die from COVID-19 as they are compared to white Americans. And in some states, thinking of Kansas and others, black Americans are seven times more likely to die of COVID-19 than white Americans. I know many of you are joining from the UK and we've seen extreme disparities in who becomes infected, who dies from COVID-19, who's policed more heavily because of new pandemic authorities given to police. So these things are very much connected. I've been doing lots of interviews this week for NPR and others about race and the intersection of the pandemic, protests and racism. And I know that in science, we like to think that we do our science in a neutral, objective bubble, and that's utter crap. Clearly, we do not. We exist in a world with so much injustice and so many biases. And the reason I say this is so connected is because when we think about those communities that are most vulnerable to infection, most vulnerable to dying from the disease, those same communities often exist in medical deserts, but also in, he in health information deserts. So they live in areas where their newsrooms have been decimated, local news has disappeared. So they're actually not just vulnerable to the spread of disease, but actually really vulnerable to the spread of misinformation and disinformation about disease as well. So I'll get into some of these things. Thank you so much, Mahmoud, for inviting me. Thank you to your team for organizing this event. And you gave a really nice introduction, um, but I'll just to um, help you understand where I'm coming from, what my journey has been, how it is that I went from an NHS doctor to doing public health in the States and then transitioning to journalism. I know it's an unusual trajectory, but again, they're all very much connected. So I was a junior doctor in the UK, uh, realized that actually as much as I love clinical medicine, I'm really interested in the root causes of illness. Sure, someone turns up in A&E, they've got a broken leg. Sure, someone turns up in A&E and you make a cancer diagnosis, but what were all the steps that led them to becoming ill? How does their environment, their housing, their wealth, their lack of wealth, all of that impact their health. And it was that frustration at not always being able to deal with the root causes that led me to leave the UK, come to the US, where I trained in applied epidemiology and investigating epidemics as an officer in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. The EIS is housed within the CDC and within the US military as part of the Public Health Service. And EIS officers are a core of scientists, and physicians, some veterinarians too, and some dentists for some years. And what you are is you are the federal government squad of disease detectives who are deployed wherever there is an epidemic occurring. But more than that, you also get to investigate some of the root causes of why did this epidemic occur in the first place. The reason I went into journalism was because when I got sent to do these epidemic investigations, it was one after another, it was very busy work. I realized my singular focus was on the spread of a virus, the spread of a bacteria, the spread of a fungus. But actually, it wasn't just a disease that was spreading and causing ill health among a population. There was also information that was spreading. Sometimes it was accurate information. Sometimes it was an overwhelming amount of accurate information. Other times it was misinformation and disinformation. And I'll explain a little bit about those terms in a minute. But I realized that I had this singular focus on disease when actually the communities that I was tasked to protect were vulnerable to information as well. And I particularly had an aha moment when I was investigating an epidemic of what we colloquially call flesh-eating bacteria. So group A streptococcus causing necrotizing fasciitis in the Navajo Nation. And you know, early on in an epidemic, what you're doing is you're getting a lay of the land, you're going door to door, you're trying to find more cases and warn people in the community about what's happening. And I remember early in this epidemic investigation in the Navajo Nation, walking up to people's doors and saying, do you know anyone who has these symptoms? Does anyone in your house have these symptoms? And one morning, this mother, young mother, opened the door and she had kids running around her ankles. And she said, no, we're, we're fine, but I know someone who has gotten very sick from this outbreak. I'm really worried about my kids. What can I do to protect them? 
And I thought, oh, well, that part's easy. I've got the answers for that. And I said to her, what you need to do while this epidemic is spreading is make sure that you and your kids have really good hand hygiene. Make sure you are washing your hands with soap and water regularly. And she looked at me and she said, wash our hands with what water? And thousands of people, I learned, on the Navajo Nation do not have access to clean running water. So you talk about health disparities and you talk about the root causes of ill health, this very serious bacterial epidemic that was causing people to lose lives, to lose limbs, to lose loved ones, could have been prevented had there been a real focus on tackling the immense poverty, the racist history in in which caused the Navajo people to live on that particular reservation, and just the fact that people did not have clean water. And at that point, I had my oh my gosh, what am I doing as a public health doctor? I made this switch from clinical medicine because I really care about population health. Here I am investigating epidemics, trying to protect communities and people are dying because they don't have clean water. And I realized at that point that for me, it felt to be an effective and a good public health doctor. I needed to engage more with storytelling and raising awareness. And the way to do that was by training in journalism learning how it is that you translate an epidemic investigation, other technical issues into the kind of stories that people will read and that will make people care. So I went to journalism school after I trained in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, As Mahmoud mentioned, I became a newspaper reporter covering epidemics, Ebola, Zika, there are so many. I also work as a CNN medical analyst. So right now it's busy covering the pandemic. And I came to Stanford in 2017 as a journalism fellow, specifically three years ago to investigate the role of news during epidemics and what we can do to better protect people from misinformation and disinformation. So that work just feels even more relevant now. This problem of false health news, it's nothing new um, and it's clearly not unique to COVID-19. It's a problem we've been tackling for centuries. Um, It could be something like Gwyneth Paltrow's company selling fake cures, selling jade eggs, or there are also decades old anti-vaccine myths that are very powerful, very sophisticated. But even the issue of false news itself is not new. We've had yellow journalism existing since the 1800s. What might be new is the speed at which false news travels. It has more platforms, has more ears. And there is evidence to show that false news now travels faster and farther than accurate information. So I'm being really careful with my words. I'm saying false news. I'm not saying fake news. And that really matters to me because I'm a journalist as well as a physician. And in journalism, we are in the business of words. We should, we don't always, but we should be using our words really carefully, very deliberately, understanding the power of words. So I'm very deliberately saying false news and not fake news because fake news is a term that's been weaponized by the oppressors to diminish and degrade journalism. That word, that phrase fake news has been levied to just discredit the work of journalists. And I, as a journalist, especially watching the coverage right now of the protests of police brutality have lots of criticism of journalism. The industry needs a massive redesign. Newsrooms are not diverse. They are not representative of the communities they supposedly cover. So I have all of this critique of journalism, but at the same time, I want to defend journalism. I want good journalism to exist. And so one way of fighting back against the oppressors who are trying to discredit journalism is by not using the language that they have weaponized against us. And also, I'm a scientist, so I like to be specific. And so that's why I'm going to share share this nomenclature with you of different categories of information. You have misinformation, and this is false health news or false news in general. My, um, My focus is obviously health, but misinformation is false news that is spread without any bad intent. So an example of that might be somebody saying to you, oh, I've heard that if you drink bleach, and this is actually something that was spreading on Reddit a while ago, somebody saying, if you drink bleach, that will protect you from the coronavirus. That person may not hate you or be trying to kill you via bleach consumption. They might truly believe that that's real and that's why they're sharing this awful news with you. 
The difference between misinformation and disinformation is the intent because disinformation is also false news, but it's false news that is spread with the intention to cause harm. And I'll go through some examples of that. Then you have malinformation. And malinformation is actually accurate information, but that's weaponized to cause harm. One example of malinformation might be classified information about somebody that should not have been made public, but that is made public and it's spread deliberately to cause harm. So you can kind of look at this as a Venn diagram. I've taken this diagram as well as these definitions from First Draft News, which is a really great organization. Started off as a nonprofit a few years ago. Now it's housed at Harvard's Kennedy School. And First Draft News, I encourage you to look it up, even if you're not in journalism, because they offer some really good trainings and some really good resources about the pandemic and teaches ways in which we can modify our news consumption to make sure we are getting accurate information. First draft news also kind of goes through, goes through these different categories, all the way from information that's completely fabricated, it's just made up, to information that's manipulated, meaning there's a kernel of truth in there somewhere, but it's been manipulated. And you can see all these different categories. When we combine misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation together, we can call them information disorder. And this is a useful concept because we're avoiding that term, fake health news, fake news. We are talking specifically about misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Um, and I'll talk a bit about why conceptualizing these types of information as information disorder can be useful when I get to a later part of the presentation about solutions. But now that I've given you this language, this nomenclature around misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, um, which are mostly false, some with the intent to cause harm, some not, I want to trouble these definitions a little bit. Because yes, those things can cause negative health impacts, but what about the negative impacts of accurate health information? The challenge here is not just countering misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. It's also being really careful with our messaging of accurate information. So what's an example of this gone wrong? Think back to the 2014 to 2016 Ebola epidemic in West Africa. I remember going there to Liberia to report and people saying to me that when the CDC and other aid agencies arrived, in West Africa, they shared truthful messages with people there. They said, if you have symptoms and these are the symptoms, it could mean that you have Ebola, so please come to an Ebola treatment unit. And by the way, here is some more information. You should know there is no known treatment or cure for Ebola. And that was accurate at the time. There wasn't even a vaccine or anything like that. So people that I interviewed said to me, well, I heard these Western doctors saying there's no treatment and there's no cure for Ebola. And so I thought, why would I go to them for help? And so they went to different healers instead. They went to healers who told them that they did have cures, that they did have treatments that would work. Of course, those treatments didn't work because it's only now that we have some effective therapies against Ebola. But that information from CDC and other organizations backfired in some cases. Those people who heard it thought, I'm not going to engage with you. I'm going to go to somebody who's telling me they can help me. And of course, that started off. along with the American Academy of Pediatrics to make an announcement and tell all vaccine manufacturers in the US to immediately remove thimerosal from vaccines. And they also told physicians across the US to delay the birth dose of the hepatitis B vaccine in kids who are low risk. So still give the hep B vaccine to kids who are high risk, but delay it for kids for newborns who are low risk. So that was a decision that was made. That was an announcement that was made. And I'd love to engage with you at the end of my talk and hear what you think about this statement. I'm going to read it to you. The American Academy of Pediatrics said, 
parents should not worry about the safety of vaccines. The current levels of thimerosal will not hurt children, but reducing those levels will make safe vaccines even safer. While our current immunization strategies are safe, we have an opportunity to increase the margin of safety. So I count about four safes, safeties in there. I find this interesting and perplexing. Um, and I see that somebody has raised their hand, but I hope we can talk about this later. I want to tell you now about some of the consequences of this action, of asking vaccine manufacturers to remove vaccine, of asking physicians to delay the birth dose of hep B vaccine for low-risk kids. What happened soon after that 1999 announcement was doctors were confused by the recommendation. About one in 10 American hospitals suspended all hep B vaccines for newborns, regardless of risk level. And there's at least one documented case of a young child dying from overwhelming hepatitis B infection. Parents, it turned out, were kind of alarmed by the policy change reasoning. They were saying, well, if you remove this thing from vaccines and you told all manufacturers to remove thimerosal, then it can't have been safe in the first place. There's a New England Journal Medicine article I can share with you if you want to read more about this, where the authors state that parents' faith in the vaccine infrastructure was shaken because of this communication. And it turns out that from 2000 onwards, there were anti-vaccine advocacy groups established based on this belief that thimerosal had caused autism in children, which, is, which it is not known to do. So yes, we should think about the spread of false health news, but we must also think about the consequences of well-meaning actions based on evidence, based on what we think is objective, neutral, solid science. And it's complicated. Within science journalism, I want to just pull the screen back a little bit so you can also have this window to what's happening right now as journalists around the world are scrambling to cover this generation defining public health crisis. What happens in an epidemic, for example, with the Ebola epidemic, I was a reporter at the Dallas Morning News at the time, a Texas based, a North Texas based newspaper. Um, and when Ebola arrived in Dallas, as it did in 2014, the entire newsroom mobilized to cover that story because epidemics and infectious diseases are not just health and science stories. They are city hall stories. They are transportation stories. Epidemics are educational stories. They are governance stories. So our transport reporter was scrambling to cover how this case, and we ended up with three cases of Ebola, was impacting the public health, uh, public transport system because it was. There were education reporters covering how it was impacting schools because it did impact schools. What happens, unfortunately, during a public health crisis is you have journalists who are overwhelmingly trying to do a solid job of providing facts, of providing information to the public, but as they are reaching out for sources, scientists, policymakers, others to give them information, unfortunately, oftentimes what you hear is the loudest voice. You hear the scientist who wants to tell you what they think, as opposed to the scientist who might actually be an expert in that specific thing that you are covering. Um, I won't go too into depth on this. I do when I train journalists. One of the things that I say to them is you have to vet your sources, which you do routinely, but usually you have the luxury of time. During a public health crisis, you have to be even more careful about vetting your sources. You want that source that says to you, oh, I can't answer that particular question that you're asking me because I just specialize in the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2, for example. It's frustrating to hear that as a journalist because you just want your questions answered. You're like, you're a scientist, you know what you're talking about. But that person may not be the best person to talk about the immunology of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you want to be wary of those sources who want to speak on everything. You want to make sure you're talking to sources who are really expert in the things that they are speaking about. It gets tricky, right? Because in science, there are lots of caveats. We know that even when we do a study that's robust, there are limitations. You end up in a situation where you're not going to find a scientist, I hope, who will go on the record to say, all vaccines are safe all of the time. 
a scientist is going to really be like, well, most vaccines are, but some cause adverse events and you need to be careful of this and that. That can be tricky as a journalist. On the other hand, you will get people who are not credible sources who will go on the record to say all vaccines are unsafe all the time. It gets more complicated because as I started off by this presentation by saying, science is not neutral and objective. We scientists operate within the world with all of its structural injustices. And we ourselves have implicit and explicit biases that we bring into the lab, that we bring into the policy room with us. Science has a very unethical history. We could do a whole lecture just on Nuremberg and Tuskegee and Guatemala and the ways that poor people, black people, brown people, sex workers, the disabled, the elderly have been exploited in science. That history isn't very ancient history. You know, unethical studies have been done recently. People remember, and they have a distrust in medicine, the medical establishment, and the scientific process because of it. Um, we also have this problem of false equivalence in journalism. False equivalence is when you set up two opposing sides of an argument and make it look like both sides hold equal weight when they don't. And you present both of these views as valid. And that's a logical fallacy. It happens less, but it still happens where an editor will say, you've done this story on vaccines and all these people in the story are pro-vaccine. You need an anti-vaccine voice in there to balance it. No, you don't. You do not want to fall into that trap of false equivalence. To also peel back the curtain on science journalism and the way information spreads during a crisis, I want to put you in the hot spot. So I want you to think about this scenario that happened on March 7 in Italy. The Corriere della Sera newspaper received a leaked memo. I think it was from a disgruntled official who had been sent it legitimately. Um, it looks like the federal government in Italy had sent this memo of a potential quarantine of 16 million people to local officials to get feedback. But this official leaked the memo. And so now you are in your newsroom with this career defining piece of information that holy crap, the Italian government is thinking about quarantining 16 million people. That's huge news. And don't people have a right to know that this is what officials are discussing and this is what might happen tomorrow? So would you publish that information? You got the leaked memo. Do you think that the Italian public should know that a potential quarantine of 16 million people is imminent? It would have affected this large of a region, the largest lockdown in peacetime. So what happened? Well, the story was published and the impact was that many people, potentially thousands of people flocked to bus stations, train stations, gathered in places in a way that you would not want them to gather during the peak of a pandemic. And so the next day after that was published and after people flocked to get out of the region because they did not want to be in a quarantine zone, Italy reported its highest day-on-day -day rise in deaths from COVID-19 up until that point. It's sometimes hard to trace back a particular series of events to a journalistic decision, but we know that journalism has impact. We hope it does. It's why many of us go into journalism, because we believe in the potential of sharing information with the people in a way that helps people make informed decisions about their lives. But journalism requires making really difficult decisions sometimes in a dynamic situation. I even remember during the Ebola crisis, you know, in Dallas, we never thought we'd be the epicenter of Ebola in the States. But once that first case of Ebola, that first person arrived in Dallas, all eyes were on us. And so as a newsroom, we were sometimes getting information, for example, two nurses looking after that patient in Dallas became infected with Ebola and very seriously ill. We had information on who those nurses were. We had photos of them, but we didn't want to share that information until their families knew, until we had fact-checked it. 
And so you're in the newsroom thinking, you want to be first as a journalist, you want to be the one that breaks the news, but you want to be ethical too. Except as we're having these conversations in the newsroom, the newsroom is, is a, a newspaper newsroom, but it's flagged by television so that we can watch what's happening on Fox and CNN and BBC and all of that. And we see photos of these nurses appear on the screens because we've been scooped and other outlets have decided we're just going to run with this information that we had been holding on to. So there's a lot of information that's moving during a public health crisis. There's just a lot of information in general, much of it accurate, much of it helpful, but there's tons of it. And then on top of that, as a journalist, you're not just thinking about disseminating information, you're thinking about how to counter the false narratives that also endanger people's lives. We think about a free press as the immune system of a democracy. It has that potential. It doesn't always live up to that. Journalists have a potential to counter false narratives, to disseminate accurate information, and perhaps most importantly, to hold the powerful to account, which is why I worry so much about the thousands of Americans, at least I know the data here, who live in news deserts, places where their local newspapers disappeared. They don't have good accountability reporting anymore. When I came to Stanford in 2017 initially as a John S. Knight Fellow, and I was researching how news evolves uh, during a public health crisis, I was looking at Ebola, I found that um, reporters weren't well supported or trained to cover something of that magnitude, certainly not of this magnitude. We know the public has an appetite for information. People need to know how to stay safe, what's going on, but there's this deluge of information. And actually what I learned from interviewing reporters in West Africa was that sometimes it was the low tech, small scale efforts, like people in a community might hear a myth about Ebola. They would text it to a number and they'd get a text back saying, this is true or this is not true. True. Here's what you need to know. I talked to lots of um, higher editors at large international news organizations who said that they had no plan for how they would cover an epidemic or a pandemic. They were winging it, they said. Um, and that is how I think you end up with journalism that does not have a high standard. It's also how you end up with journalists who become infected with Ebola while doing their job, and that happened. I wrote this piece about war correspondents get significant training on how to stay safe in a conflict zone, as you would hope, but science and health reporters don't. But when you get sent into a hot zone to report on an epidemic, it can be dangerous. You have to make ethical decisions um, about going in as a Westerner to a resource poor setting where as a journalist, you might have PPE like gloves and masks, but the local doctors looking after the local people who are infected with Ebola may not have any of that. So what's your responsibility then? Of course, now, you know, I say to you, uh, a free press can be the immune system of a democracy. Um, two things are happening. One, the press is under immense scrutiny and just attacks from the administration, from the White House. Yesterday, the Trump administration asked news organizations across America to retract accurate information, retract accurate information about how the police had attacked peaceful protesters. Um, also during this pandemic, because of the way advertising has been hit, there have been more than 36,000 reporters, producers, editors, who've either lost their jobs, been furloughed, or had pay cuts, right when we need journalists the most to keep us informed, both about the protests, both about white supremacy, and about the COVID-19 pandemic. So now I wanna share some examples of misinformation with you. This is misinformation that spread on Twitter during the 2014 to 2016 Ebola crisis, just to give you an idea of some of the things that we're seeing and being studied. But it's not just social media as a platform for misinformation. You also see what you might consider legacy media, you know, well-established newspapers that share false information. There's one example here of a Liberian newspaper that just kept pushing out conspiracy after conspiracy. And that might be harder to challenge. Maybe, maybe not. It can be very tricky when you have an established and trusted news source spreading false narratives. And of course, when it comes to 
trust in mass media that's been studied extensively around the world. This is data from the US that shows trust in mass media has edged down to 41% from last year. Then we have sophisticated disinformation campaigns. Remember disinformation, that uh, definition I gave you is false information that spread with the intent to cause harm. So this was in, this was during the 2014 to 2016 West African Ebola crisis when the Yahoo News Twitter account was hacked and this false information about an Ebola outbreak in Atlanta that wasn't actually happening was shared. And it was a full 25 minutes before Yahoo News was able to regain control of its account and say this was false. By that point, it had been shared extensively. This was likely spread by a group in this building in St. Petersburg in Russia called the Internet Research Agency, also known as The Agency. Um, and they did some sophisticated things, including creating a dupe of the CNN website that looked just like the real thing, but had this disinformation on it about how there was an Ebola outbreak in Atlanta when there wasn't. And the purpose of disinformation campaigns like that is to divert emergency services away from where they're truly needed and also to cause fear, which can spark chaos, mayhem which can be very dangerous to public health. You might see people flock to emergency rooms, fearful they've been infected of something that's not even in their region, and that can quickly overwhelm health systems. There's also been Twitter bots and trolls amplifying the vaccine debate. It gets even trickier because when you look at the data on this, so many of the tweets that were sent by these bots and trolls weren't explicitly anti-vaccine. Some of them were, some of them said outright, vaccines cause autism, which they don't. But some of them were just gently stoking a debate where perhaps there needn't be one. And we're seeing this now too. Apparently nearly half of all Twitter accounts are tweeting about coronavirus are likely bots. And this is being studied more extensively in real time. When it comes to disinformation campaigns, I just want to give you an example of how targeted and sophisticated they can be so that you can share in my frustration with how bad a job we do in public health of countering these false narratives. Um, so the, the messages that come from anti-science and anti-vaccine groups are well researched, well thought out, often well funded. And our response as public health officials and physicians is, I'll just give you the facts. I'll give you a leaflet. You know, I got frustrated with World Health Organization a few years ago when there was a really bad outbreak of measles in Eastern Europe. And the World Health Organization tweeted something like, but it's okay, we are disseminating pamphlets. And I was thinking pamphlets aren't cutting it. People are making decisions based on these sophisticated anti-vaccine messages. We have to do better at countering those. So let me tell you about what happened in the Somali American community in Minnesota. Um, about 10 or 15 years ago, Somali parents in Minnesota were worried that there were higher rates of developmental delay and autism amongst their kids. And so they raised these concerns. They were vocal. They were worried that this was happening. And the public health department did what scientists do, which is say, we accept your concern. Now we're going to go study it and see what's actually happening. So the scientists go away to do their research, which we know can take years to do well. In the meantime, anti-science and anti-vaccine groups literally fly into Minneapolis, hold town halls with these concerned Somali. They have armed guards at the town hall so that reporters and public health folks cannot go. And what they say to the Somali parents is, we hear you're worried about higher rates of autism among your kids. It's true, the rates are higher, and here's why. It's because you vaccinate your kids with the MMR vaccine. This vaccine causes autism. So they were directly speaking to the concerns of these parents who wanted to make the right decision. And they were doing it quickly, in real time, and preying on their particular anxieties and vulnerabilities. Some of these people were recently arrived in the US and said to journalists after the fact that they had lost family members, including siblings, to measles back in Somalia, back in refugee camps in the Horn of Africa. So measles was very real. Um, they'd lost people to that, but they were believing that the vaccine was dangerous now. So what happened in Minnesota was that you had vaccine rates among um, Minnesota-born children of Somali descent go from 92% to 42% 
over the course of 10 years. That sadly sparked the biggest, most dangerous measles epidemic in Minnesota's history, in recent history, in the past 30 years. This measles epidemic was very much concentrated on the Somali community. It was Somali children ending up in hospitals, ending up in the ICU. Years later, the public health department did come back with its analysis and said, we take your concerns, we've analyzed the data, and actually it turns out that you might think they might appear that way, that there's higher rates of developmental delay among Somali kids, but it's actually not true. The rates aren't higher. But by that point, it was too late. The damage was done. So when we talk about information disorder, that combination of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, one of the reasons why it's helpful to contextualize it that way as a disorder is because much like a disease, information disorder spreads. It's contagious. You see person-to-person -person transmission. You see point source transmission. And you see so many similarities between disease transmission and information disorder transmission. For example, you might be hearing at the moment about super spreading events. These are cases where maybe 10% of infected people within an epidemic are responsible for up to 80% of cases. So you have few people responsible for many cases. And it turns out that you have this, a similar phenomenon when it comes to information. Maybe some people, because they are a celebrity, because of their platform, because they're influential, because they have many Twitter followers, are able to disseminate information faster and farther than other people. So this is like looking at network analysis of disease, and it turns out you can also pinpoint transmission and clusters of information spread from person to person. You can look at tweets, you can look at Pinterest memes, you can look at WhatsApp, Facebook, many different data sources. So this, this is just reiterating the idea of super spreaders. We've seen with SARS and MERS, we're seeing now with SARS-CoV-2 as well, and that same concept applies to um, information disorder. So a long time ago, I did some mathematical modeling and I studied how it is that you can make models of how disease might spread. Some of the more basic mathematical models, oh, you may have heard of these because they've been in the news so much, SIR models, where you have people who are susceptible, people who are infected, people who are recovered. And these are some of the differential equations that you plug into your computer programs to figure out, okay, I think this is how infectious the disease is. I think it's spreading in this way. Let's see how it might spread, where it might spread to, who it might affect over the next weeks, months, or even years, right? We've been seeing models all over the news, and many of us are learning about the many caveats and flaws of mathematical models. They can be useful, though. Well, it blew my mind when I trained as a journalist and started looking much more at public health communication that you can use the same models of disease spread, disease modeling, to look at information spread and information modeling too. I'll talk more about how that relates to solutions now because I think it's really important to not always just address the challenges. One of my frustrations at the moment is that we're talking more about misinfodemics, so epidemics of misinformation. They've made the news, the World Health Organization is starting to address them, and I think to myself, finally, finally public health agencies are realizing the power of information and realizing we can't just attack the spread of a disease, we have to attack the spread of information disorder too. Unfortunately, though, some of those um, ways of countering the information are primitive. So I'll go through some solutions of how we might counter misinfodemics, the spread of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. I think a really important thing to do is to train and support journalists. That's tough right now because, as I said, 36,000 journalists have lost jobs, been furloughed, or had pay cuts right when we need them the most. But we need to redesign the model of journalism so that journalists are really working for us, really have the adequate training and support to give us the information that we need. There are fact-checking services that exist at the moment. I help with one where you have experts verify queries, questions, concerns that come from journalists. So that means you have scientists saying, oh, you, you're saying this about how SARS-CoV-2 is spread. We're going to do the fact-checking for you. Make sure you have the most accurate information to share with the public. You also need to make sure that journalists are trained with sources and how to vet sources and find sources, as I mentioned. And public health agencies should address the concurrent spread of disease and information disorder. So the last thing I'm going to talk about in this presentation is another solution, which is inoculation theory. So I've shared with you how the spread of information disorder shares parallels with the spread of a pathogen. 
And actually, you can use a medical metaphor to protect against the spread of misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Essentially, you can immunize against rumors. So inoculation theory was first described in 1961 by a social psychologist at Harvard called William Maguire. Maguire's idea was that small, weakened doses of a false message can provide immunity to larger doses of false messaging. This has been studied for the last 60 years. It's been shown to work. One of the interesting things, the two ways that primarily we think it works, although now there, are, there is research being done to understand different mechanisms of how inoculation theory works, is these two primary ways. One is that by inoculating people with small, weakened doses of a false message, you're firstly giving them a warning. You're saying, hey, heads up, there's this pandemic spreading. You're going to hear some information about how it's false, how it's a government conspiracy. I'm giving you a heads up. This false news is incoming. The second thing that you do is provide good, compelling, believable, interesting, dare I say it, entertaining counter arguments that say to people, okay, I'm giving you a heads up you're going to hear three things. You're going to hear this virus was man-made in the laboratory. You're going to hear that this virus was weaponized to cause destruction in America. You're going to hear this other thing. And then you say, here's why each of these things is inaccurate. Let me tell you how they are inaccurate. Let me give you some counter arguments. And in this way, inoculation theory has been shown to be effective, um, especially in teen smoking campaigns um, and some other areas too. Um, it's not being used at the moment to counter information disorder spreading during the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish it was, but I want to end my presentation with one example for you. Um, one way that information disorder is, inoculation theory is being used to counter um, information disorder. This is a, an intervention called the Bad News Game made by social psychologists at the University of Cambridge in collaboration with researchers and developers in the Netherlands. And what they have done is created a game. And it's not health focused yet, although we're trying to pivot to that, but it's teaching people how misinformation and disinformation spread during election campaigns. Um, and it's using the principles of inoculation theory. And it turns you into a bad actor, actually, so that you realize how easy it is to spread false narratives and how vulnerable we are. So in conclusion, information spreads in tandem with disease, misinformation and disinformation can travel farther and faster than accurate information. As I've shown some examples of how sophisticated and highly targeted disinformation campaigns can be and how much we need to support journalists to make sure we have models of journalism that are diverse, equitable, and supported to cover pandemics. Um, and then I talked about the shared transmission dynamics of information disorder and disease spread and a medical analogy, a medical way perhaps of preventing spread of, of information disorder is using inoculation theory. So I have a book coming out soon that you can pre-order now that goes deeper into inoculation theory, examines the origin myths of many common health hoaxes, um, Um, hello. Hello. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sima Yasmin, for that wonderful presentation. And now we will transition into the live Q&A. So we had a number of questions submitted. Um, for the first question, what is the rule of the education system in ensuring that people have skills to determine fact from myth? Yeah, this is a really important part to make sure that we are enhancing literacy and especially health literacy so that young kids are learning how to discern solid journalism from journalism that's not including diverse sources, that it's, is excluding people that isn't fact-based. So I think, yes, my presentation puts a lot of the onus on us journalists because I want to see us doing a better job, but the question is important in making sure that the education system 
also teaches news literacy and health literacy as well. And there, there are different camp, uh, organizations doing that. There's a group at Stanford doing that too. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, um, how do we improve people's ability to distinguish fact from fiction? Well, that's what I'm getting at with this idea that the, some of the fiction is being spread by bad actors who are well-resourced, who are sophisticated, who are doing their research into vulnerable populations, preying on people's fears and vulnerabilities. Whereas when we go in, it's very much like, oh, we are the all-knowing physicians. We are the all-knowing scientists and policymakers. We have the facts and this is all that you need. And actually what we're not doing is engaging with communities, building relationships with communities, understanding what their particular fears anxieties and needs are and then working in conjunction with them to disseminate the kind of accurate information that can save lives so i want to see more of that engagement happen and not just we disseminated leaflets and pamphlets and here are the facts because that doesn't work okay. thank you and for the next question how can journalists effectively communicate the scientific aspects of vaccine development pandemics etc when they might not be familiar with them and are trying to communicate them to an audience who may not have the expertise to understand. Yeah, it's a big problem for those two reasons, right? There's a public that may not have had, um, that may not be familiar with the language of immunology and vaccine development. And then, like I said, during a crisis like this, all journalists mobilize to cover the story. You don't just have health and science, veteran journalists covering health and science. You have many people, you have general assignment reporters. And that's why I did that research and made that case that we need to adequately train journalists so that they can cover epidemiology, they can cover studies, um, know which ones are legitimate, which ones are preprints, which ones will never make it through peer review, for example. But it requires training, it requires support. And I do um, urge you to look at first draft news that has resources about this. I also did a training for the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting a few months ago, like early in the pandemic. So there are resources that are out there to help journalists do their job better. I wish there was more institutional support from newsrooms, and I don't think that's happening well at the moment. Thank you. And for the next question, um, what checks are there to maintain ethical standards in journalism? Do you think they are enough? Um, hmm. I don't think there are enough, and especially going from science into journalism, I was shocked at what journalists can do that scientists would not be able to do without a very thorough IRB, for example. Um, we, some newspapers and some newsrooms have like public editors that they are the people that you can say, hey, I read this article and it was, um, I'm worried about how inaccurate it was or biased it was that the New York Times does not have a public editor anymore. And when a colleague of mine challenged the executive editor of the New York Times, challenged Dean Bacay and said, you need a public editor. Dean Bacay's um, response was, oh, we have Twitter. People can just complain via Twitter. So we need much more rigorous ethical standards for journalism. We need to be able to hold large media organizations accountable too. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, Many people associate certain news outlets with a specific political bias. How do you think these biases affect the way accurate information is perceived by the public? Oh, it's been studied. So you can even look at the COVID-19 pandemic, look at who watches Fox News, who watches CNN, who votes Democrat, who votes Republic, and therefore who is more likely to um, believe in shelter in place orders and respect them, who is more likely to get vaccinated once a vaccine is available. Um, it's, you can look up those studies and I recommend doing it because it, what, what you watch and how you consume your news, of course, it massively impacts the decisions you make and what you believe about the world. Okay, thank you. And for the next question, in what ways can we identify false news from accurate information? And do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah, I do. I don't have loads of time to go through it, um, but there is a blog up on the Stanford Healthcare website that I co-authored that gives you tips on how to spot misinformation. Really quickly, I'll give you some. If it's very sensationalist and um, has a lot of certainty when we're actually in a very uncertain time, that's one warning sign. Um, when it says sources say that by versus actually telling you which sources say it, that can also be a red flag. 
be careful about sharing um, photos and videos. Even if they look believable, there are ways to do a reverse image check to see where they actually came from. Because even now, many of the um, photos and videos purporting to be of mass COVID-19 graves, for example, when you look back, they're years old and they're to do with something completely different. So you can use reverse image check too. But there are a lot more tips. First Draft News has some, the Stanford Healthcare um, app, also has some and then my book has a whole my book has a bullshit detection kit inside it to kind of make you very expert at separating the crap from you know the accurate information okay. thank you and for the next question as a journalist the struggle for publishing accurate information and being the first to publish is evident how do you balance the importance of medical information that you are publishing along with the race to be the first to publish the story even then, when you publish this medical information, can you ever be 100% certain it is accurate? Well, I don't think about, I think about a certainty being along a gradient, right? And do you think about that hierarchy of evidence that we have in, in science and in medicine? Right now, it feels like Twitter is at the apex of that, and it really shouldn't be, but it's how many of us get our news and where some of those loudest voices are shouting. Um, what I would say to that is that, yes, there's a rush to race, to be first, to break the news, to have the scoop. But there are many journalists who are being slow and careful. Um, I wish there was less reporting on some of the preprints because I look at the preprints and think, oh, this is never going to make it through peer review. But there are journalists who are reporting on it and giving the caveat that, look, this hasn't been peer reviewed. I'm not sure that that's sufficient. Thank you. And speaking of Twitter, it has just recently adopted the fact checking ability to people's tweets. Do you think this would help in fighting misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation? I mean, it certainly caused retaliation from the president who did not like having that assigned to his tweet. So we'll see how that plays out with social media companies, although some like Facebook are just seem to be pandering. Um, I think it can help. I think even, I think it can just signal to somebody that, oh, everything I read on here isn't necessarily credible and that I need to dig deeper. So I think it's one of many tools that we need to employ to help people. Thank you. And for the next question, do you believe information disorder applies to medical journals where information that would negatively impact a study is hidden in order to achieve a more positive result for a trial, for example, a pharmaceutical trial? I mean, and not just pharmaceutical ones, there are people who go through journal articles and find discrepancies and find inaccuracies and push journals to retract information. I mean, even the whole Andrew Wakefield debacle, it took The Lancet 10 years to retract his terrible, fraudulent, unethical study. He was doing colonoscopies on young children and taking blood samples from kids at birthday parties. It was highly unethical and it still took that journal a decade to retract that information, which for many signals the, the beginning or at least the growing movements of anti-vaccine campaigns. So yes, it's a problem across um, news outlets and all types of different um, information sources. Okay, thank you. And for the last question, question um, when good science does take years and decades to come to a conclusion while false information can be manufactured, in a few hours or days, the science even stand um, relating to the story you shared about concerns of Somali parents, for example. Yeah, I know. I wish we could be quick, quick, right? But we can't and they can. But it doesn't mean that we give up. I think it means that we have to really build relationships with the communities. I think it means that we have to be on top of their concerns. And I think we have to explain the scientific process more. There's such a divide between we are scientists, we do what we do behind closed doors, and then we'll just give you the information at the end. I think we need to bring people into the scientific process with us, explain why it takes a long time, get people interested and engaged, and understanding the uncertainty and the certainty that's all part of it. So I think we just have to be really community oriented, not believe that we are the sole holders of information and bring communities into the scientific process with us. Thank you. And I think that covers the last submitted question by the audience. Thank you, Dr. Yasmin, for presenting such a wonderful lecture and for answering some of the questions that our audience had concerning misinformation during the age of COVID-19. And thank you everyone for being here and we hope you will join us for tomorrow's lecture pre presented by Professor Karai Nadiao. Today's lecture will be shared on our YouTube channel and on our website as soon as possible. So please be on the lookout for that in case you'd like to rewatch today's event or if you'd like to share with others. Thank you all so much and thank you once again, Dr. Yasmin, for being here today and for presenting the fourth lecture of the Oxford SARS-CoV-2.
lecture series. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mahmoud. And thank, thank you, you everyone for your attention. Stay safe. Thank you, you as well.